it's time for Facts Are Your Friends. <laughs> ben and his bell-bottom rock music. Like Epiphone Flying V plugged into a fuzz box. Some Marble Reds. Way to go. He's looking at me like, do what? You know how I roll. That's <laughs> exactly. Um, all right, so... I need to make this abundantly clear on the front end of this facts of your friends. I, this is not a conversation about judgment. This is not a conversation about me um, casting blame or stones. I know there's a lot to be said about what we're going to talk about uh, for the next few minutes. So um, I've learned this the hard way on social media. I can say something like, hey, moms or dads, don't yell at your kids. And some of you hear that and you go, "Um, you're right. I need to not do that. But some of you immediately get triggered and you go, oh, yeah, well, dads and husbands should, like whoever I'm not talking to, they need to stop. You're right. So this is one of those topics that the moment I say it, you're going to either go, "Ah, not me, or you don't even know what I'm dealing with, or I'm such a loser, or some of you are really, really underwater with this issue. And so I want to be as gentle as possible and be honest, be honest. And this is us just sitting down, having a chit chat over a card table. Okay. So just think of it. Um, this is not me talking at, talking down to you. It's me talking with you. Okay. I want to talk about drinking alcohol. Um, here's, here's um, why this became an issue with me. Um, I, rarely drink. I just don't like it that much. Um, I'll have one drink here or there. Um, it's really, really rare that I have two, not cause I have any judgment against it, whatever. Um, in fact, there's times I wish I did. I just, I just don't feel good. I just don't like it. I don't feel good. Um, I just get bloaty and, ugh. um, but then I got this whoop strap and I noticed even when I would have one glass of wine, if I had one beer or one, like, one of these fancy bourbons one of my colleagues has my sleep would flush itself down the toilet it was it was so dysregulated i couldn't believe it and then i started asking my other friends here at the office who also had whoops and we were comparing data and talking about it because it was a relatively new product at the time this was a couple years ago and it has happened to everybody and what was interesting is all of us were quietly in our own world essentially just quitting drinking for one reason it screwed up our sleep so bad that we could go to bed at the exact same time and wake up at the exact same time, but our sleep was so screwed up. Um, and so then my wife got it and she noticed it, right? And then in short order, it was one of those, huh, oh yeah, our dinner bills. When we would go out to eat, the bill was so much less. And then grocery bills were so much less. And then it thinking about, Hey, do we need to Uber here? Or do we, all that stuff just kind of shifted. And so I saw what happened in my personal life. Things just got, um, less expensive, less burdensome and my sleep was better. And so I began wondering like, why, why was I having one or two drinks? Like what, what was that getting me? And that started me down a rabbit hole of the literature. Um, And I was going to go through all the literature and stuff. Listen, um, Andrew Huberman, Andrew Huberman over um, at the Huberman Lab podcast. I'm recommending you go find it um, after you get done with the show. Go find it. He does a two hour plus, two and a half hour master class on alcohol. All of the research, what it does in your brain, which hormones and brain chemicals it affects. He really does his best to find some redeeming quality. I'll be a little more, there's just very little redeeming quality. It just messes up most of your body. Ethanol is a poison. I wish it was another thing, but it's a poison. And so then Kelly sent me this article the other day um, that was published by um, the, the AP News. Post-pandemic, the rate of deaths that can directly be attributed to alcohol who rose nearly 30% in the U S during the first year of COVID. Um, the rates have continued to be up net over what they've ever been. Um, 
The rate of such death has been increasing in two decades before the pandemic by 7% or less each year. In 2020, they rose 26%. It's the highest rate recorded in at least 40 years. Such deaths are two and a half times more common in men than in women, but both rose in 2020, the study found. And there's been a couple of great articles and even a remarkable book. I'll link to it in the show notes. The um, the titles just left me here um, about alcohol consumption in women and how the cool thing for women became, oh yeah, she drinks beer or she drinks whiskey or drinks bourbon. And that was a way that everybody felt women were getting a seat at the table. But there was a particular pressure among women to, oh yeah, I can drink this or this. And it was a it was a part of a overall power play, part of a move. And women are paying a toll with their physical and psychological health. And then there's the whole uh, wine Wednesday or wine in Wednesday or what's it called? What's it called, Kelly? There's wine Wednesday. There's so so much around. It's a stay at home mom, mom culture. It's mommy wine juice, down wine day down drinking, Wednesday, day drinking. The whole, yeah, yeah, yeah. You can buy cute little shirts. Yes. you know. And, yeah, rosé all day and yeah, all that yeah. stuff. And I, and you notice like you should go to Target or go to any of these little boutique shops or Walmart and it's all like sweatshirts and little towels and little things just about how fun day drinking is or because I have to do it. It's my only way to get through my life. And then I, I noticed it when Mad Men came out, but it just <laughs> all across the country, office complexes, men, everybody, everybody started drinking more. They started drinking more. And I don't know if it's because it looked cool. I don't know if that's the, the show. I just I just noticed a, a non-scientific correlation between the two. There's not, nothing causal about it. Everybody's just drinking more. A lot. Um, and then there's the uh, JAMA, the Journal of American Medical Association. They looked at a wider range of deaths linked to drinking. So there's deaths drink, by people who just drink themselves to death, right? But then there's motor vehicle accidents, suicides, um, often... Suicide people who are um, considering dying by suicide will drink enough to take their inhibition away. And it leaves them with no breaks on a forever decision. Falls, cancers, uh, pancreatic cancer, liver cancer, and, and other things. So there's thousands and thousands, and tens and tens and tens of thousands of deaths are from drinking too much over a long period of time. And Tens and tens and tens and tens of thousands of deaths are tied to acute intoxication. I fell down. I got in a wreck. I died by suicide, whatever it happens to be. And then there's obviously chronic dangers such as high blood pressure and stroke and heart disease and liver cancer, all this kind of stuff. So here's all I want all I want to say today in today's Facts of Your Friends. It's a new year. As I've had this conversation with more and more people across the country, as particularly with moms and with business owners, and um, and then more and more with police officers, military folks, dads, I, it's running the gamut, okay? I want you to be very intentional about examining or re-examining the role alcohol plays in your life. Here's what that's really important. I uh, used to pass out a survey to all my incoming students, particularly like I did at the law school. I did it at a couple other places, but it was just a social norming survey. What's your drug use? What's your alcohol use? Um, what's your sexual habits? I wanted to, to get a snapshot of what the student incoming student body thought about the world, how they responded to the world. And I would always read these statistics to the students. And what was always fascinating is if the students thought, 95% of people got drunk once a week. But the self-reported data was actually 65% of people got drunk once a week. So they were off by a chunk, right? So I would read those and, and, and the point was, hey, if you think everybody's getting drunk all the time, the reality is they're not. If you think everybody's having a glass of wine at 11.30 in the morning just because the baby won't stop screaming or because your boss is kicking your butt, whatever, they're not. They're actually not. And it's this weird self-fulfilling prophecy I always remember the statistic that, that broke my heart and would silence the room. And it was 80 to 90, sometimes mid to high 90s, 90% 90 of people drank to fe feel more sexy, drank to facilitate engagement in sexual behaviors. And every time I told the entire auditorium, the entire theater, if you have to drink 
in order to be with somebody, that is a way you are overriding your body's innate systems to do something your body is telling you it doesn't want to do. And the same can be said for going out, for feeling sexy, for having hard conversations, for having fun, for going to sleep. If you are drinking to override your body's signaling system, that sleep is scary, that there's too much chaos going on in your life, that your partner isn't safe, that your work environment is a mess, that you are uncomfortable being around people. Those are individual things that you can work on with a counselor, that you can work on with a community of friends, that you can work on with a journal, some of those things. But when you drink to cover up parts of your life just so you can endure it, man, I just want you to hear me say your life's worth more than that. And I would rather have a season of discomfort getting to the bottom of why does my body tense up when I'm around you? Because we're married. Let's get to the bottom of that. Let's just don't have three or four drinks just so we can have sex once a week. Let's don't do that. Now, if it's a part of, if it's a, I'm not going to tell you to not drink, okay? I'm not going to tell you to not enjoy your life, to not go have fun, all that kind of stuff. Um, I just want you to be conscious about how and when you're, or you're using alcohol. Also, if you are struggling with an alcohol addiction, let this be the year. Let this be the podcast. Let this be the minute that you push pause on this show and you call somebody and you say, I need help. Day one. Or that you get out your phone and find the next meeting and you're there. Sitting in the back row. Looking around wide-eyed, but you're there. Let this be the year that we're done poisoning our bodies and our relationships and our mind. And we say we're going to engage life. And it's going to be hell on earth, especially at the beginning. But you are worth that. You're worth that. And so, again, it's not about judgment. This is about y'all are just my friends. It's not about you won't see me with a drink someday. You probably will. Um... It's about being very conscious of what is this drink doing for me? And more importantly, what do, do I need this? And if I don't need it, why am I doing it? Why am I doing it? The alcohol death is growing in the U.S. And it's up to us to, to change that. Some of that's going to be, most of that's going to be us deciding. Let's build a life worth living. Let's build a life. Let's build a non-anxious life that we don't have to run and hide from. Let's get people in our lives. Let's create a context where we can walk right through the middle of it. So that's facts of your friends. Examine your relationship with alcohol. You're worth it.